turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3 this evening. We continue in our study of the seven churches. Tonight we will be talking about the last of the seven churches. That is the church of the Laodiceans in verses 14 through 22. A theologian calls this church the neutral church. Others say it is the eh church. But Christ says this was a lukewarm church, not cold nor hot. Another theologian comments that this was the worst of the seven churches to which Christ wrote. And let's find out why this is the case. Number one, following the outline we've used from the beginning of this study is the identity of the correspondent. We find that in verse 14. Let's look at verse 14 of Revelation 3. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. Let's pause right there. The first identity of the correspondent that we find here is this phrase, the Amen. I want you to turn your Bibles to Isaiah 65. Isaiah 65, 6. My remote is not working properly. But Isaiah 65 some theologian says this is the normal Hebrew adverb that is rendered by the Greek amen, means the acknowledgement of that which is sure and valid. Jesus didn't need anybody affirming him. He affirms himself. Um, A lot of times in the record of the Gospels, you'll find before Jesus would say a statement, he would say something like this, verily, verily, right? Sometimes truly, truly. What is he doing? He is amening himself before the statement. And uh, that is an unusual use because normally you would amen after the statement, but he prefaced it with those words. So you're in Isaiah 65, and uh, I want you to be looking at verse 16 here. It is not surprising that the ending of Isaiah corresponds to the ending of Revelation. And here in Isaiah 56, we are told of the destiny of those who forsake the Lord. And although the Lord has extended His hand of mercy upon those who are disobedient, He will spare the remnant at Christ's return, purging them from their sins, establishing them in a purified earth. Now, in saying all of that, Isaiah calls this merciful God the God of, you guessed it, Amen. In Isaiah 65, 16, look at that. That he who blesseth himself in the earth shall bless himself in the God of Truth, the Hebrew word for truth is amen. 
And he that sweareth in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hid from mine eyes. So, this is the same phrase which the correspondent in Revelation 3.14 uses. And so, on the part of the Lord Jesus Christ, this really is another claim to deity, is it not? Because Isaiah calls the person here the God of truth. And Jesus is using the same language here in Revelation 3. The next title we see is the faithful and true witness. If you look at, um, go back to our text there in Revelation chapter 3. Well, you look at this identity and it ties right in to the first title. If you are the God of truth, then you are a true witness, and you are the faithful too. Now we sing the song, how does it go? Great is thy faithfulness, O God our Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee, thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Jesus claims that as well. He is the faithful and true witness. In Hebrews, we see another claim of Jesus where it is said of him that he is yesterday, today, and forever. He is faithful, he is true, he is forever. This is significant. Why? Because... What he was about to tell the church, the people of the church of the Laodiceans was true and faithful, and none can accuse him of fake news. Next, the correspondent here referred to himself as the beginning of the creation, Revelation 3.14. Now, this is a little bit ambiguous in our English translation because of this idea that we get when we read that. And what is that idea that we get when we read that phrase, the beginning of the creation of God, that Jesus Christ is the... that Jesus Christ is created. It gives us this idea because of this phrase, but the Greek is not ambiguous. It's very clear that he's not just the beginning of creation, he's actually the originator of creation. It doesn't mean that he was first in line of the created beings of God. It means that he is actually the source of it. He is actually the originator of creation. And this is further clarified by John himself, who wrote John 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten Son of God. The Apostle Paul as well clarifies this in Coloss Colossians 1, 16 and 17, that all things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. So, no ambiguity there. This phrase refers to the fact that Jesus Christ, the sender of this letter, the correspondent of this letter, is the creator of everything. And then lastly, 
in verse 15 of Rome, Revelation 3, 15, it says that the correspondent knew their works. Knew their works. That is scary. Jesus knows your works. The ones that are not displayed before men and the ones that are seen by men. He, Jesus Christ, knows their works. A veteran pastor said this, works always reveal a person's true spiritual state. As indicated by the Lord's words, you will know them by their fruits. Though salvation is by God's grace alone, through faith alone, it is the works of that individual which will confirm or deny the presence of genuine belief, genuine salvation. So Christ knew that the Laodiceans' works indicated, sadly, that they were unbelieving. Therefore, they were not truly saved, as we will find in just a moment here. Number two on our outline, let's take a look at the city and the church of the Laodiceans. Laodicea was about 45 miles southeast of Philadelphia and about 100 miles due east of Ephesus, along with Colossae and Hierapolis, it was one of the cities in the fertile Lycus Valley. You see that on the map there at the southernmost part of the seven churches in Asia Minor. Its wealth came from the production of a fine quality of famous glossy black wool, there's your wool there from a black sheep. Whether dyed or naturally in color is not known. That the city's banking assets also were noteworthy is evidenced by the fact that Cicero cashed huge bank drafts in Laodicea. Laodicea was a very wealthy city. It was so wealthy that in AD 17, there was an earthquake that took place there, it decimated the city, but they did not receive or they did not beg for money from the Roman Empire to help them rebuild their city. They used their own resources. This was a very healthy, very wealthy city. Laodicea had a famous school of medicine as well. And a special ointment known as the Phrygian powder, famous for its cure of eye defects was either manufactured or distributed here, as were ear ointments as well. And near the temple of the special god associated with healing, Menkaru, who later became identified with Asclepius, there was a market for trading all sorts of goods. Zeus the supreme God was also worshipped in the city. And what you're seeing here on the monitor is one of the ruins of one of the temples in Laodicea. Here's a sad commentary by the historian William Ramsay. He said that Laodicea is difficult to describe. Why? Because... No one thing stands out. There were no excesses or notable achievements to distinguish it. 
It was a city with a people who had learned to compromise and accommodate themselves to the needs and wishes of others. They did not zealously stand for anything. There was a six-mile-long aqueduct brought Laodicea its supply of water from other cities, uh, from the cities of Colossae and Hierapolis. The water came from hot springs and was... So in this six mile, of what you're seeing here is uh, an aqueduct where they built from Colossae and from Hierapolis so that they could push water through these aqueducts. From one of the cities, um, hot springs of Hierapolis, obviously the water is hot. But by the time it reaches uh, Laodicea, through this six-mile aqueduct, it becomes what? Lukewarm. The fresh water coming from Colossae also is cool from Colossae, but through this aqueduct, by the time it reaches Laodicea, it becomes nasty. It smelled and it was lukewarm. Okay? For all its wealth, the city had poor water. It was not good to the taste, and it stank too. So, as for the church in Laodicea, there is a clue that it may have been founded by Epaphras. If you recall, I did an exposition on this uh, from the book of Colossae. Epaphras, he was the one who most likely started the church in Colossae, which is a neighboring city to Laodicea. And Epaphras was the first pastor of Colossae. Church history suggests that it might have been Archippus. You remember Archie? Archie was Philemon's son. And they had their church there in Philemon's house. Um, the 4th century Apo Apostolic Constitutions, the book Apostolic Constitutions, named Archippus as the bishop of Laodicea. But there is another sad note here. I want you to look at Revelation 3.14. You probably noticed it when you were reading it, but I want to draw your attention to it again in verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Did you get that? When you look at the other churches, they were addressed in this manner. The church in Ephesus, the church in Sardis, the church in Philadelphia. But when it came to the Laodiceans, it's interesting. It's changed to what? The church of the Laodiceans. Meaning to say that this was theirs. This was the people's church. This was not the church of Christ. This was not the church where Jesus Christ is the builder. It was a church that was built by the Laodiceans. This perhaps is an understanding that this was not Christ's church after all since it was of the Laodiceans. Sad commentary. All right, number three. The commendation or the condemnation. There is no commendation here, but just concerns and condemnation of the Laodiceans. Let's read beginning in verse 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. 
You see the illusion here about their water in the city? And Jesus is using that. He's so good. He's so good at this. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest, I am rich. Okay, another allusion to the wealth of the city. And increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched. You're really, you think you're rich. You're actually wretched. You're miserable. You're poor and blind. Another allusion to the medical eye salve. And naked. What is that? An allusion to their wool industry. You think you have all these garments to be proud of? You're actually naked. Verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that is, Jesus' eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. All right, let's pause there. So, a few things here. Number one, they were neither cold nor hot. What does this mean? The key verse here is verse 19, where it says, you're not zealous. I want you to be zealous. Okay? Church, are you hot tonight? Are you, meaning, are you zealous about the things of God? Or are you cold? Jesus is telling them, you're lukewarm and you need to be zealous. That's what it means. They were lacking zeal. They were useless to Christ because they were complacent, self-satisfied, and indifferent to the real issues of faith in Him and of discipleship. Here's an example of one pastor of a huge church who lacks the zeal, and he was neutral to the real issue of salvation in Christ. Larry King says, Phoenix, Arizona, hello. And the caller says, hello, Larry, you're the best, and thank you, Joel, for your positive messages and your book. I'm wondering, though, why you sidestepped Larry's earlier question about how we get to heaven. The Bible clearly tells us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to the Father is through Him. He must be a Baptist caller. That's not really a message of condemnation, but of truth. Joel Osteen says, yes, I would agree with her. I believe that. Larry King, so then a Jew is not going to heaven? Osteen, no, oh, here's my thing, Larry, is I can't judge somebody's heart, you know? Only God can look at somebody's heart, and so I don't know. To me, it's not my business to say, you know, this one is or this one isn't. I just say, here's what the Bible teaches and I'm going to put my faith in Christ. And I just think it's wrong when you go around saying, you're saying you're not going, you're not going, you're not going because it's not exactly my way. I'm just, Larry King says, but you believe your way. Austin says, I believe my way. I believe my way with all my heart. King says, but for someone who doesn't share, it is wrong, isn't he? Well, yes. Well, I don't know. If I look at it that way, I would present my way, but I'm just going to let God be the judge of that. I don't know. I don't know, he repeats. Larry King says, so you make no judgment on anyone? Joel Osteen says, no, but I... King interrupted, what about atheists? Austin says, you know what? 
I'm going to let someone, I'm going to let God be the judge of who goes to heaven and hell. I just, again, I present the truth and I say it every week. You know, I believe it's a relationship with Jesus, but you know what? I'm not going to go around telling everybody else if they don't want to believe that that's going to be their choice. God's got to look at your own heart. God's got to look at your heart and only God knows that. What was all of that? That's the myth of neutrality. That's what it was. This pastor in Larry King Live was neither hot nor cold. Henry Morris writes, The Laodicean church was apparently receiving many members. It had a large and prosperous congregation, impressive facilities, and an active program. But it sought to be neutral on controversial matters, to maintain open dialogue with both left and right, to have recognition from the mighty and the wealthy and the intelligentsia. It was not cold to the vital truths of God, His creation, His word, but neither would it take a firm stand and proclaim a true witness and Christ amazingly said, if they could not be hot, he would rather see them cold. And the exhortation is given, be cold or hot. But don't be lukewarm. Be zealous. Stand with God. Meekly, yes, but firmly proclaim the truth. Verses 16 and 17. Verses 16 and 17, we re read that already, are not a promise. They are a threat. And what was Jesus threatening, threatening them with? Well, he said he would spew them out of his mouth. This is a graphic language to cast out such a church. One theologian said, some churches make the Lord weep. Others make him angry. The Laodicean church made him sick. Another concern that we find here. Jesus says to them, You say you're this, but you're not. You're rich, you say. You're increased with goods. You're in need of nothing. But you're actually what? Wretched. You're miserable, you're poor, you're blind and naked. So uh, they were apparently ignorant of their real condition. They were oblivious to that. They thought they were the church in town. Why? Because they had so many members. They had lots of money. But they were actually wretched. They were actually poor. They were rich in material possessions and self-sufficient. The spirit of the surrounding culture had crept into the congregation and had paralyzed their spiritual life. And here's a slightly different interpretation of that. It could mean that they honestly thought they were spiritually rich because of their physical wealth. They may have interpreted their material wealth as a blessing from God and thus have been self-deceived as to their true spiritual state. Here in verse 17, a reference to the Laodicean spiritual destitution and pitiableness before God. They were poor. They were blind. They were naked, refer to the three sources of their miserable condition. Lukewarmness, then, does not refer to the laxity of Christians. Listen to this. It didn't refer to their laxity, meaning they, they didn't. It, some people would say that they were complacent, okay. But this is actually a comment on the condition of their souls. 
Meaning, they were lukewarm because they were actually not saved. This is bad. Origen, the historian, understood the passage to refer not to backslidden Christians, but to the unregenerate, to the unsaved, playing church. Number four. The correction of the Laodiceans, verses 18 through 20. I've read verses 18 and 19 already. Let's pick it up from verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Where have you heard this verse? A lot of times you heard this verse as a what? An invitation, right? For people to open up the door of their heart to receive whom? Jesus Christ. That's fine, I think. But you look at the context here. The church was in trouble. Observe, where was Jesus? Inside or outside? Outside the church. It is a sad day when Jesus Christ is outside the church. It is a sad day for that church, for any church, where you can't find Jesus inside. He's outside knocking at the door. Hey, can somebody let me in? Wow. Jesus tells them, I want you to buy gold from me. Look at verse number 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. What does this mean? What is buy of me gold? Well, riches... Real riches is in Christ, right? Christ only has the real currency to cover their spiritual bankruptcy. Not that you or I could ever buy salvation. This is not uh, meant here. This language is an invitation to go to Jesus instead of relying, instead of relying on their material wealth, instead of looking at that as evidence of their spiritual condition, they should assess themselves and go to Christ and buy gold from Him. I want you to look at Isaiah 64, or Isaiah 55. Look at this. This language is an invitation to go to Jesus instead of relying on their material wealth. Jesus is not teaching that they could buy salvation into heaven. Remember that people need to realize their utter spiritual bankruptcy as far as their self-righteousness is concerned. They have none. They have no righteousness that can Usher them into heaven. They don't have the real gold righteousness in order to be saved. You see, their gold could not buy them salvation. And Jesus tells them, buy my gold, right? Look at verse 50, uh, chapter 55 of Isaiah, verse number 1. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy. Same language here that Jesus uses 
Revelation 3, 18. And eat, yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. All sinners have to offer is their hopelessly lost condition. And in exchange, Christ offers His righteousness to those who truly repent. Let's move on. Uh, stay there in Isaiah because we'll get there. Jesus tells them not only to buy from Him gold, but what? Buy white raiment. Now again, as I mentioned earlier, this is another allusion to their wool industry. Okay, look at Isaiah 64, 6. Why did Christ tell them to buy from him white raiment? Well, because Isaiah 6, 64, verse 6 says what? We are as, we are all as un, unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are what? As filthy raiment, filthy rags, filthy wool, filthy garments. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Because without the robe of righteousness of Jesus Christ, you're damned. And that's why he says to them, buy of me white raiment. Okay? This is why they needed to buy white raiment from Christ. Another correction that Christ gave to the Laodiceans is this idea of buying from Christ eye salve. The ointment that was a healing agent to whatever ails whatever ailed their eyes why laodicea had a famous school of medicine where a special ointment known as phrygian powder famous for its cure of eye defects manufactured and distributed there this is clearly an allusion to that jesus says buy isab from me instead why because he's the only one who could open their eyes, right? From spiritual blindness. You've sung that famous song? I once was blind, but now I see. It is the amazing grace of Jesus which causes a blind to see the truth Look at Acts 26. Acts 26. In one of Paul's testimonies, he recalls exactly what happened to him. What happened to Paul when he got converted? You remember that he was on his way to Damascus, right? To persecute Christians. Jesus knocked him off his high horse, literally. And what else happened to him? He was blinded by the light that he saw. Jesus blinded him. Why do you think Jesus blinded him that way? Do you remember how long he was blind for? Yeah, he was blind for three days. Why do you think Jesus did that to Paul? And it's not a trick question. I think because Jesus wanted him to experience physically what awful blindness had gripped him spiritually. He was blind for three days. He didn't eat as well for three days. And Jesus sent him who? Ananias. Ananias said, no, Lord, I don't want to go because that's a terrorist. Remember that? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Jesus says, no, he's okay. I've converted him. I want you to go and help him and heal his blindness. So Ananias says, okay, Lord, I'm sorry. I'll go. And so Paul was healed of his blindness. And the record tells us that there were are, are the, uh, as though scales came off his eyes, right? And we get a glimpse of why Jesus did that to Paul, okay? Look at Acts 26, verse 18. The Apostle Paul was uh, explaining his conversion testimony to Agrippa. And this is what he said. Jesus did that. Why? Because of verse 18. To open their eyes. Isn't that wonderful? To open their eyes with what? With the truth of Jesus. And to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. It was because Jesus wanted to use Paul to open the people's eyes so that they would see salvation. And so it was with the Laodiceans. The truth is that which will make them see. It is the truth of Jesus Christ which would make them free. The illumination of the Holy Spirit opens up your blinded eyes. That's why Jesus said, Buy I salve from me. Last point, Revelation 3, 20. Oh, we know this verse. We've, I've, I've probably used it many times in the invitations I've done, even door knocking, on the streets of California and Okinawa, Japan, Philippines, use this to persuade people to open the door of their hearts to receive Jesus Christ. But in the context here, ladies and gentlemen, is about the church of the Laodiceans. It meant that that church contained very few saved individuals, if not none at all. Wow. So, what is this for us? For us, Riverside Baptist Church, let's assess ourselves. Is Jesus inside our church or is he outside of our church knocking on the door wanting to come in. What do you say, church? We want him inside constantly, don't we? That's why at the beginning of our worship service, we look to his words. We read his words publicly. We pray to God in His name. We give our offerings materially, monetarily. But more than that, we should give our lives a living sacrifice for the work of Jesus Christ. When the deacons meet and the trustees meet, we look to the word of Christ. Why? Because we acknowledge that he is in this church and he is the builder of his church. We want him in 
No, we don't want to hear his knocking on the door. We need to assess. Yes, as a corporate body, as a local church, we need to do that. But we also need to do that individually. Christians, is Jesus outside of the door of your heart? Or is he inside? Does he have to say? Can he say some things inside your life? Meaning, have you just compartmentally left him in a corner and say, Sunday, Lord, I'll go to church. But Monday, uh, this is my life. I want to live it the way I want to live it. And when you have an attitude like that, Jesus seems to be outside the door of your heart. If you can't say amen, say ouch. We need to assess ourselves. The Laodiceans needed to repent. They needed to be zealous for the Lord and overcome this lukewarmness. When they did, that is, if they did, they were to sit. They could sit with Jesus in his throne, meaning that they would be saved. But if they did not, they were doomed in eternal destruction. And so Jesus closes his letter to the church of the Laodiceans. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Meaning, if you hear this, don't remain hearing it, but actually taking the counsel of Jesus Christ and applying it in your life, and actually do it in your life. May the Lord find us faithful. Let's close in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for these letters you have sent to the churches in Asia Minor. I pray, Father, that we would take it to heart and not just... Be hearers only, but doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, let's all stand. Let me give you the benediction for this evening, and you are dismissed after that, okay? Here it is. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, Jesus says even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The Lord bless you. You are dismissed.